Good morning. This is Myra. I am at Cairo of Oak Ridge and today we have had Winter Storm Quinlan. Winter Storm Quinlan has really made everybody upset about going outside I believe it's broadcasting now. So we did have a little trouble with our Facebook live feed, but I think it's working now. So this is Myra Mansfield. I am at Cairo of Oak Ridge this morning. We usually have a Saturday morning worship service. We have it on Saturday for a reason, but we used to have it on Sunday and we changed, but it's uh, just kind of our personal pursuit of more of Jesus and more of learning of, about his life and the life he lived. So Jack, my husband, normally leads the service, but before the storm even came, which has really put people, uh, made people uncomfortable, the snow, but we had already decided we were going to flip things around today. I'm usually the children's pastor and would be with the children. And we are lucky enough to have our granddaughters here with us this weekend. So Jack is with them, and I'm in here, and I'm going to be teaching on Jeremiah. I started this series a couple weeks ago, and now I'm going to get into the second part of it. And just talk about the storm a minute, because it's made people so uncomfortable just the idea of snow and potential harm to themselves that people didn't want to get out and i mean that's true everywhere you go out right now and you can see that there's hardly anybody out driving around like there would be on a normal saturday morning but this is actually a beautiful way to have snow in east tennessee because at our house i think we have about five inches um, I don't know where you are in East Tennessee, but I'd say it's about the same. It's like double what they thought we were going to have. They thought two to three inches, and we got about double. And normally, this kind of snow would cause us to have bad streets. But this snow, because it's been warm, early March, early part of March has been so warm, so our roads are warm. And so what happened was it snowed everywhere except the roads. And even what was on roads melted when the sun came out. And so it's really beautiful outside. It's beautiful. But we don't have the mess we would have sometimes with it. And so it was able. we were able to come on down to the church. And some of our people didn't want to uh, come. So we decided we would have a live service. We've never done this before. At least for several years we haven't done a live service. So anyway, um, this morning, uh, I'm going to um, start out with a prayer, and then I'm going to get into Jeremiah. Lord, I just want to lift up everyone who's watching this or will watch it, and I just pray for them to have peace and grace on their lives. I pray that they will be able to uh, have something that is said in this teaching to be able to penetrate their hearts and their minds and who they believe they are in you lord and and become changed some more some more and some more because we're changed in a transformation process into the image of christ that's what god delights in is the little bit more like christ and the little bit more like christ and so as long as we keep moving you love it god so I bless everyone who's listening to have a great day. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been in a series called The Prophet in You. The reason we called it The Prophet in You is to try to help people see a little bit more of Christ in them. 
because Jesus was the great prophet of all times, but there were many prophets in the Bible, even regular people, who were used by God to speak for him, to get messages out into the world, to hurting people, to dying people, to rebellious people. Uh, God loves people so much that he goes to extreme measures to try to get people to come to him and and to experience his love we started with abraham and then we found out the next bible in the western christian bible that we use here not the hebrew bible but the bible we use the next one is named a prophet in genesis is aaron He's actually in the beginning of uh, Exodus. Aaron, the brother of Moses, is the next one called a prophet after Abraham. And the next one after that is actually a prophetess, Miriam. We learned so much about this. And then Moses. After Moses, you may not have realized, Joshua is considered a prophet. A prophet. The Judges, the book of the Judges is considered a book of prophets because there were so many prophecies being fulfilled in the book of Judges. But also, they were making prophecies. Prophecy is a huge deal in the Bible. Everything just keeps rolling forward through prophecy. And so, now we're all the way up to Jeremiah. It's taken us over a year, and we've uh, been really 14 months. We've been on this pilgrimage to find out more about prophets, to see how that relates to us, and how maybe there might be something in us or some time in us that Christ calls us to speak for him a message of his love. It's always his love. Even the hard messages of the books of the prophets that are like telling about all the sin you're sinning against God. They're still always woven in there, this thread of, but I love you. Come back to me. I love you. I'll take you back. That is the heart of God throughout eternity. From the beginning of time with man until now, his heart has always been, I love you. Come close to me. So when we started Jeremiah last week, we talked about the, the kings that were there at the time of Jeremiah, which was very important because Josiah was the king, and he's the king in most of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, he... Josiah was that king that became king at eight years old. He's the youngest king in the Bible. Uh, we looked back at his family mess, big dysfunction in the family, a lot of disobedience, worship of idols, things like that. But young Josiah's mother loved God, and his mother's father came into the court and helped this eight-year-old run the country. And that's when it was in the 13th year of the reign of young Josiah, so he was 20, approximately 20, 21 years old. That's when this other youth, Jeremiah, whose father was a priest, leaves their city of Anatot, which was a day's easy to walk to Jerusalem from Anatot. He comes down and becomes a prophet. And God said, you know, he basically pulled him out of the priesthood because the priesthood was something you, a legacy you left toward your family. To, to your children, to your son specifically. But God told Jeremiah, no, i got a different plan for you. You're going to be a prophet, and you're going to be a prophet to the nations. It wasn't only to um, Judah and Israel. He prophesied to nations and Syria, Egypt. So he, this young man took, accepted the call of God, and a part of our study was to look at what these prophets were experiencing and what's the meaning of the Hebrew word nava, which is the experience that the prophets have with God that sets them apart. And that nava is this ecstatic experience of heaven, God's love, God's peace, God's joy in the midst of having to say very strong words to convict people of their sin. And it's kind of like Pentecostals experience God today. Sometimes it's a little bit more out there. And the prophets we could show you where they were known for doing erratic things and what I call a parabolic 
prophecy, which is like a parable. It's the same word Jesus used, the parables. The prophets used a parabolic expression of prophecy sometimes to do strange things to get people's attention. So, so we worked through chapters 1 and 2 and part of 3. That was Jeremiah's first sermon. He was told to go down into Jerusalem and to start speaking this prophecy that was basically, you all are rebellious. He was saying it against his own father. He said, you priests, you kings, the princes, the Every, all the children of Israel and Judah, you're rebellious, you're sinning against God, and therefore he has decided to bring judgment on you, to discipline you. So you can, if you can imagine this young guy, he may have been between 15 and 20 years old himself, possibly younger, possibly older, but probably about the age of the king. And he comes down and he just starts walking through Jerusalem, or he might have stood on a street corner. We have street preachers here in Oak Ridge that do that. Or he might have just been walking around the, the temple, giving these prophecies. We don't know exactly the setting. We do know he went to Jerusalem and he gave this long sermon. It was very condemning, but it was also a call to return to God. So if you could just imagine yourself being that young kid and having to take that huge calling from the Lord to have to go and speak so powerfully to these people, even his dad, because he said, you priests. He was even talking against his own father. So do you think that drew persecution? Yes, that drew persecution on him. And that was so huge of him to be able to stand up against that. So some of the notes that I made today, we're going to move forward from the rest of chapter 3 and on possibly into chapter 25, but we're not, we don't have time to read all of this verse by verse aloud and study it like a Bible study group. So I picked out some key things that I think you'll find interesting. One is, how did inspiration come to them? The Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, as I was studying, I found people that said the book of Jeremiah was actually edited and that they added parts like they added chapter one, the intro, after they brought together all of these prophecies that were written by the scribe, his scribe Baruch. And sometimes Christians get a little irked with the idea that scripture was edited like that because the Bible says all scripture is inspired by God, given by God for a specific purpose. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And so I would answer that with this. We can never disregard scripture from being inspired even if and we don't know it's all speculation we don't know the history we weren't there but even if they did take pieces and put it more in a more organized fashion God said scripture is inspired so we have to believe the scripture was inspired and that he, if there was editing and things like that, that God was involved in that too. Because it was inspired word of God, a message to mankind of his love, but also his caution about disobeying. So chapters 3 to 25 basically continue a prophecy that Israel has been an unfaithful wife and a rebellious child. So you've got this young guy, and he's out there having to say things like that to his people, to his father, to his, his mother, to his friends, to probably people he's been studying scripture with. And it was a, a very intense situation for a young man or any person, even us, to have to be in. But Jeremiah is very real about his feelings in this book which sets him apart a little bit from some of the other prophets because Jeremiah actually says, these are my feelings about you making me do this. 
and he talks about the intensity of it and and the ridicule and things like that. We're going to look at that. Um, he's he also provides a look at a prophet's inner struggle with faith because everything we do must be out of faith. So it's a struggle with faith, believing God told me to do these things and say these things, a struggle with persecution and with human suffering. So I'm going to jump around a little bit, but in um, Jeremiah 3, verse 22 through 25, there is an incredible prayer just stuck in here at the end of his second prophecy in Jerusalem. Now, this was still during Jeremiah. I mean, Jer Jer Josiah, King Josiah. Jeremiah went down, made a second prophecy, and he basically said, God is divorcing you. It's uh, someone in our church last week said, this is a, a letter of divorce to the people for their disobedience. God's saying, I'm divorcing you. But... At the end of that, Jeremiah puts this most beautiful prayer. And if you're a Bible student, you remember probably in Daniel 9, Daniel interceded for the nation with this beautiful prayer out of his own heart. And it's written in the scriptures and stories of Daniel. Well, Jeremiah's done the same thing right here. In chapter 3, verse 22, it says, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Then it shifts and he makes a prayer and he says, Behold, we come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Indeed, lies, deception come from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. That was the false worship locations. It says, The deliverance of Israel is truly in the Lord our God, for shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth. Their flocks and their herds their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame and our confusion covers us for we have sinned against the Lord our God, we and our fathers from our youth until this very day and have not listened to the voice of the Lord our God. So you can see Jeremiah begin to wrestle with having to give this divorce decree to his people and not wanting to you know, you wouldn't, even if you brought a word like that to someone, a hard word, you wouldn't want to have to say that. He doesn't want his family to leave God or to be under judgment. And so he adds this word of repentance. We come to you, Lord. This is the truth, our lives, our deception. And then he says, we have sinned even from our youth. He's telling the truth. But it's in, wrapped in a prayer, just like Daniel. Also, in Jeremiah 3.17, he actually makes a future prophecy that the Gentiles will be saved. And in my translation I have in front of me right here, it says, At that time they will call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations will be gathered to it, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem nor will they walk anymore after the imagination of their corrupt heart. He's saying all the nations will be gathered to Jerusalem. That's actually not been fulfilled yet, but it is being fulfilled. I went to Israel, Jack and I did, in 2017, and it was amazing to see all the nations, all the nationalities, all the ethnicities that were there in tourism. In Israel, it was amazing. It was beautiful. It's just a beautiful thing that the nations are coming to the Lord. So he makes this important future prophecy that we're standing here approximately 2,500 years later, and it still hasn't fully been fulfilled. He, God promises, this is frequent through the prophets, in uh, Jeremiah 3.22, he promises forgiveness and healing in Jer in 22 it says return you backsliding children and i will heal your backsliding it's on us 
first of all, to turn toward God. He's always calling us and wanting us to do that, but it's upon us to turn toward Him, and then He will rush in with strength and love and peace and all the things we need in order to stay turned. So often we keep turning back to our old life, and He wants us to come and stay turned and keep our face on Him and our focus on the experience with God, the Word of God, the prayer, the uh, disciplines of faith. So he promises forgiveness and healing when we turn to him. And Jeremiah's giving these promises. He's giving these judgments, but he's also giving these prayers. And all of this is very blessed. At one point in um, Jeremiah 20, uh, jumping forward to 20 a minute, and then I'm going to come back to this a little bit more. But in Jeremiah 20, this is a very interesting chapter. Because Jeremiah is just laying his feelings all out there in front of the Lord. And in verse 7, he says, You enticed me, and I was enticed. You are stronger than me, and you prevailed. My ver version says, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. For since I spoke, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach and derision every day. Then I said, I'll not make mention of him or speak about him anymore. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing or resisting. I was weary with trying to resist it. And I could not endure it. And then it goes on, his, his passion, his emotion, his feelings about all of this. He is disappointed. He's weakened. He's embarrassed. That's what we see in verse 7. Disappointment that... You, some versions say you tricked me. Some versions say, God, you deceived me and I let you do it. You were stronger than me. That, that's the calling. Your calling was, it, it was so, I was enraptured by it. And so I, I had to do it. He said, but then I became embarrassed by doing it because I mocked all the time. He's so intense here. Think about it. A feeling of maybe being betrayed. Like, God, you dragged me into this. And now look at these people. They all hate me. Everybody hates me. Can you imagine yourself being that way? I can imagine myself. If I was in his shoes, I would be crying. I would have tears streaming. I would be so intense. Like, God, you're letting this tough stuff happen to me. You, you let all these people mock me. They hate me. They persecute me. They drag me and throw me in a pit. They chain me up. They do all of these things. And he's laying his heart out there before God. You know that's okay. It's okay if we do that. We need to have a relationship with God where it's okay for us to come to him sometimes and just lay our feelings out there. You know, last night I was praying for somebody. I said, Lord, I insist that you move in this person's life. I've been praying a long time. It's okay if we just be honest with God. You know, he said, I desire that you worship me in spirit and truth. That's what he means. I want you to be honest. I want there to be truth between heaven and you. That's what God's saying. And then Jeremiah says, you pushed me into this, Lord, and I'll let you do it. You were too much for me. This is what it says in the, you know, so many translations say you're stronger than me and I, and you prevail. It's basically a, a paraphrase. I think I got this out of the Message Bible paraphrase. You were too big for me to resist. And now I'm a public joke. They all poke fun at me. Imagine this. Wouldn't that be difficult? Also in that chapter, let's see, in chapter 20, verses 14 to 18, he goes on. He, this whole section is just him laying out his heart and his angst with God and his, his hurt of being persecuted and 
all his feelings. But in 14, he says, Cursed be the day when I was born. Do not let the day when my mother bore me be blessed. Now, he's just speaking feelings. He's not really wanting God to curse him. He's just feeling so intensely hurt by all the people, the persecution, that that's how he feels. But you know what? I found very interesting in my study that that same exact saying of chapter 20, verse 14, cursed be the day when I was born, was actually already written in the scrolls of the temple that Jeremiah had probably been learning scripture from through his father's priesthood. It's from Job. And if you think about the scripture and how the chronological order of what was, the, you know, what, what did Joshua and Judges have? They only had Genesis through Deuteronomy. That was their whole scripture. They didn't have the forward stuff yet. And King David, what did he have? He had only those first five books plus maybe Joshua and the Judges. And see, so each next person in the Bible had the scripture previously written. And we know that Job was actually one of the earliest books written. And so right here, possibly, Jeremiah was quoting scripture. And the Bible says, let something be established by two or three witnesses. I have a second witness. So that, that if that's the first one, meaning that's the first incident I can point to, you can't really build a whole theology on one idea. But Jeremiah also quotes Psalm. Now, by the time Jeremiah was alive, he had the first five books of the Bible, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. King David had already been there, and he'd already written the Psalms. So Jeremiah had scrolls that were the Psalms, and he quotes the Psalms in another place. It is in, um, he quotes Psalm 3, 13, and he says, for I hear the whispering of many, terror is all around. Did you know King David said that exact same thing and wrote it in the Psalms? I hear the whispering of many, terror is all around. You know, that really comes from the fear of men. Hearing whispering, that's so sad. You know, that's, that's so hurtful when you overhear someone talking bad about you. I have that happen every once in a while overhear someone whispering uh, some criticism against me, which that's not hard to come up with criticisms <laughs> about anybody. But how do you feel in that moment? You get hurt or you get scared because it depends on what you heard them say. So Jeremiah is saying it provoked fear in him. He says terror is all around. So it provoked fear. He heard them whispering. Maybe they were saying, we are going to put him in a pit. We're going to go to the king. Oh, there's lots of this scripture. I'm, I'm just telling you what Jeremiah says that is truth. This did happen to him. That they go to the king and make up a story and say, Jeremiah is lying. He's saying all these prophecies and he's making people discouraged. So king, you need to throw him in the prison. And they did. So anyway, you know, we don't know what he heard when he quoting the Psalms, but the point I'm trying to make here is all of us can take comfort in the Word of God, and we need to be have such a relationship with this scripture mm, that we love it. I remember when I was a young Christian, and I was just first born again, I was so enamored with God that I slept with my Bible. <laughs> I was really young, but I slept with my Bible. But that's just sort of a picture of the kind of passion God wants us to have for His Word. We need to have a passion for this and just let it soak into us, soaking in our mind, soaking in our heart, soaking into our spirit, so that when difficulty comes, that's what we say. That's what we think. Just like Jeremiah, we remember what Job was going through. And Job was in such intense place, he said, let the day of my birth be cursed. And Jeremiah's feeling that same thing with Job. And he's, he's, his heart is resonating with King David. When King David was being so mistreated by his father-in-law, King Saul, 
he says, I hear them whispering and terrors all around me. And, and Jeremiah, the word of God is coming up in him and he's saying the word that he's heard in the, in the scrolls. And, and so there may be other instances in Jeremiah where he does that. I didn't study that point all the way through the book. But my point was we need to be like that too. We're trying to look for the prophet in you. Let's look at that. How often do we hear a scripture come back to our minds? It's so encouraging, isn't it? When that happens to you and you hear a scripture come back to your mind, you can get so encouraged. Or you might hear a scripture that warns you, like Psalm 1. Stay away from the people who are gossips and who are strifeful and who are hostile, dreaming up ways to hurt people before they can even fall asleep at night. See, you may have a, a scripture comes up to your mind when you find yourself in a situation or invited into a situation, and God might say, no, stay away from those strifeful people. So the Word of God, like I started out talking about, it's inspired by God, and it's good for... Um, let me go back and look what I've had on that, because I said... oh. I'm sorry, I didn't keep it on here, but it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then this, that verse goes on to say, it guides you into everything that's good and true, and it warns you from everything that's bad and dangerous. So Jeremiah was remembering the word of God. There's actually a term about Jeremiah called the weeping prophet. I don't know if you've ever heard that before, but Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet. You know why? Because of what we just talked about. He, his scribe was one of the most blessed, anointed scribes, I would say, throughout time. And a scribe is the person who writes for you. They transcribe what you preach or and this is true in ministries today I remember a lady who talked about having a job with Kenneth Hagin and she transcribed all his sermons so that was back in the day when there wasn't a 